Well, my name is Colby Thomas. I'm one of the pastoral residents here at the church, and I have to say it's a bit of a relief to get up here and see that people are here and chose to be here apart from staying home and catching the first quarter. Um, So it really is a privilege to be with you. Um, Go ahead and open your Bibles to Colossians chapter 2. We're going to be looking at verses 6 through 15. And as you do that, I'm going to pray for us. Oh, Father God, we ask that you would give us fresh ears and and open hearts to hear your gospel continually, Lord, knowing that we will never graduate from it, but it is to your gospel that we cling each day. Lord, help us in that this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, it seems to me that just by nature of our being human, we're a people that are constantly seeking to improve upon what we know. And we see this in technology with technological improvement. We see this with our homes, home improvement, self-improvement. We're always reaching for something better. We're trying to add to and take something good, and we want to make it better. And one area that it's really stuck out to me that this is happening is in entertainment and these streaming services that are popping up. And you'll notice every month or two, there's a new platform, and they're adopting the, the nomenclature of, of plus. So, for example, we, we have Disney Plus now, because Disney wasn't good enough. We need Disney Plus. And we have ESPN Plus, and we have Apple TV Plus, and PlayStation Plus, and all these different versions of plus. And as we read the book of Colossians, it, it becomes clear that these Christians, to whom Paul was writing, we're being called to adopt some version of gospel plus. And, and Paul's answer to them is that there is no such thing as gospel plus. There is only the gospel. And your mind might immediately think, that, well, this is what we heard this morning, right? But in this morning, we're in Galatians 5. So is it a coincidence that we end up in similar ideas? And, and when we think about it, it's really not a coincidence, If you look through the New Testament and Paul's letter, this is a repeated theme throughout that Christians are constantly being tempted to to try and add to the gospel that we first received. And this has been an issue since the beginning of the church and for all of church history. And Paul's response to this is quite simple and clear. In Christ, we have all we need. And there is no such thing as improving upon the gospel. In any gospel that could be described as gospel plus is no gospel at all. So we're going to read verses 6 through 15 in Colossians chapter 2. And I think the text can break down very simply like this. The commands in verses 6 through 8 and the compelling truth of the gospel in verses 9 through 15. So look with me at verse 6. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him, who is the head of all rule and authority." In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Amen. So as I said, I I think we could break this into two parts, the commands in verses 6 through 8 and the compelling truth of of the gospel in verses 9 through 15. So first we look to these commands, and there are two of them. In verse 6, we see the command, so walk in him. And then in verse 8, 
See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit. And so let's consider this one first. So walk in him. It's amazing what is included in those four words. So walk in him. Is this not the entirety of the Christian life? Another way to translate this would be continue to conduct your lives in him. And that's what we're called to do. Conduct our lives in him and according to him. And then Paul goes on and he explains how with these different modifiers. And the first one is as you received him. So we're to walk in him as we received him. And and the first point is this is a message for Christians. Now, if on the off chance that you don't call yourself a Christian and you manage to find yourself in church on Super Bowl Sunday evening, then this is what we believe. This is the call that you could adopt, but, but, but this is a message for believers to walk in him as you received him. And how are we to do this? By being rooted and built up in him. And, and it doesn't jump out immediately in, in the ESV, but, but these are passive verbs. Having been rooted by God in him and being built up by God in him. And, and these analogies, they, they really run through all of scripture, being rooted, right? The, the image of agriculture, and, and it's a good image. The, the idea of, of the Christian, the roots growing down, taking hold in Christ, such that they're stable in him. And then being built up that, that, that it's a construction zone and he's constantly working, never finished, but being built up. And as we walk in him, he is doing these things to us. He has rooted us and he is building us up. And so we're to walk in him, being rooted and built, it, built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught. Now, th- this makes me think of when I was a kid and learning to play baseball. I loved to play baseball. My dad was my coach, which is a, a blessing and a curse at the same time. But early on, you, you learn the fundamentals of a baseball swing. And, and if you stick to it, then, then you're in good shape, especially up until you get to high school before people start throwing curveballs at you. But I remember watching major league players, and, and they get in the batter's box, and, and they're doing something different because they're, they're wiggling their hands, and they're swinging the bat all over the place. And when you're a kid, you're like, well, that looks cool. I want to do that. <laughs> and, and so you try, and that's when coach, a.k.a. dad, says, what are you doing? Go back to what you were taught, to do the fundamentals. And this is what Paul is calling us to do. Go back to the fundamentals of the faith, established in the faith, just as you were taught. This is what it looks like to be rooted in him and built up in him and walking in him. To go back to the fundamentals of the gospel. And then we get one more modifier, this last one, abounding in thanksgiving. I don't know about you, but this is not my natural inclination to be abounding in thanksgiving. Uh, Another way that another translation reads is overflowing with gratefulness. And this is not my, my normal state of mind, overflowing with gratefulness. I've got a lot to be grateful for, but yet it's really easy for me to get focused on my, my circumstances and be overflowing with annoyance or frustration. I start out most of my days by driving up here from Cuyahoga Falls on Route 8. <laughs> it's hard to be overflowing with gratefulness <laughs> as you drive on Route 8. But this is what we're called to as Christians. And why is it that it's easy to be overflowing with annoyance? Well, it's because we're, we're not looking at Christ. We're looking at our circumstances. And this is Paul's his call for us to look to Christ. Thankfulness is a symptom of having your eyes on Christ. Looking to the world, it's it's a fuel for despair. But looking to Christ is fuel for thankfulness. That's why we gather, because we need regularly to be reminded to get our eyes up on Christ. And so we're to walk in him, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, Abounding in thanksgiving, what, what is this? we're to conduct all of our life in him. And some of you may be thinking, well, that's it? All my life, well, that's easy. I've already failed my New Year's resolution, and you want me to change my whole life or 
correct my whole life so that I'm walking in him. I actually read one report that said 80% of New Year's resolutions are failed by the end of February. And if we can't scrape up enough motivation to stop eating sugar or go to the gym three times a week, how am I, how am I supposed to walk in him? The difficult, truly difficult things of life. And what Paul was going to tell us is that all the motivation we need comes from the truth of the gospel. Look to Christ is the message. And for this reason, it's of the utmost important that the Christ to whom we are looking is accurate according to the scriptures. And this is where this next command comes in. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit. If we're going to look to him, it has to be the right Jesus. It can't be false teaching. It can't be gospel plus. There's only the gospel. And so Paul says, see to it. And, and what he's getting at is, watch out. And, and why, why do I need to watch out and beware? Well, it says they're coming to take you captive. And this is vivid language. Think about it. Someone coming to take you captive. The, 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 the language here is of plundering. But what's being plundered? It's not your goods. It's you, your heart, and your mind. These false teachers coming to take your heart and your mind captive away from Christ. According to philosophy, an empty deceit. Now, this word philosophy, we, we have a more narrow definition of the word philosophy than the Apostle Paul did. But anything that we could describe as gospel plus or gospel minus... Could, could be described as philosophy and empty deceit. And, and Paul gives us some descriptions of what does this look like to help us understand. And the first one is it's according to human tradition. Now, we're in a different setting than these Colossian Christians from 2,000 years ago, but we'd be fools to say that we aren't prone to being guided by human tradition. So, for instance, is this not what has happened in Roman Catholicism. We start with the gospel in the early church, but then over the years, add tradition and tradition and tradition until ultimately you're, you're left with a gospel plus that looks nothing like the original gospel because it's not. And Protestants aren't safe from this either. Is this not what happened when, when liberalism infiltrated the churches? No, the Bible can't say that. There's no way it could mean that because we know the reality. What would cause someone to make that claim if not they're being guided by human reason and human tradition? And then even within a church like Parkside, is it even possible that we could be guided more by human tradition than by the gospel? And I think the answer is yes. I know where I come from in, in small town Oklahoma, there's not very many people that would say I'm not a Christian. If you go through the town, you're going to find an overwhelming majority say, yes, I'm a Christian. But what do we see when you look at their life? They don't know Jesus. They might be able to recite some facts about the gospel and about the Lord Jesus, but they don't know him. And what is this but human tradition infiltrating the church? And so we're all prone to this power of human tradition. You can look at any culture and you're going to see the power of tradition and so Paul says we're to watch out for any false teaching that's just according to human tradition and not according to the Word of God. And secondly, that this false teaching was according to the elemental spirits of the world. Now what Paul's likely referring to here is demonic forces. And the truth of the matter is behind any false teaching that's leading people to stray from the gospel, they're, they're, the enemy is there, tempting and trying to pull you out of the faith. And this is a reality of our world that we're likely to neglect here in suburbia. But it's the truth. Every false teaching has this force behind it. And so we're to watch out. And lastly, this false teaching is not according to Christ. And everything can really be summarized in this, that it's not according to Christ. And so this is the bottom line. What are you to watch out for? Whatever is not according to Christ and which Christ? Well, the Christ of the Bible. Not the Christ of your imagination, who doesn't care about sin. Not the Christ of human tradition. 
but the Christ of Scripture. And that's to where, that this is where Paul is pointing us. If it's not according to Christ, <laughs> reject it. Why? Because Jesus is all sufficient in himself. And this is where we look in verses 9 through 15. Paul gives us his reason. Why are we to walk in him? Why are we to watch out? It's because Christ is all sufficient in and of himself. Now, these verses are so packed with truth that there's very little I could say to, to elaborate on them. But my hope is that we, we as a group might be overwhelmed by the cumulative effect of them. Paul is saying to these Colossians that they're being tempted, people saying, Jesus is not enough. And Paul's saying, is he not enough? What more could you want? Consider who he is and consider what he has done. Though we're not going to see a, an explicit command in these verses, there's, there's an implicit command that is consider him. If you're being tempted to leave him or to try and add to him and improve upon him, all you need to do is consider him. And so there's, there's a, a, a number of truths that we see. The first one in verse 9 is that Jesus is God. Verse 9 says, For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. So here's another one that you can add to your play sheet when the Mormons come knocking. But is it not much more than that? If that's all we think of verses like this, then we rob ourselves Consider what we are saying when we regularly confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he is God, the God of the universe, taking on human flesh to come and die for us, take our sins upon him. This is the truth of the matter, that Jesus is God. And next, verse 10, and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. And I think the NASB captures this and it translates it, and in him you have been made complete. It, it, it's likely that Paul is playing off of the language of the false teachers in Colossae, that they're describing this idea of, of fullness and saying, well, if you want to experience spiritual fullness, then do X, Y, and Z. And though we don't know exactly what that is, we know it's going beyond the gospel. But the goal is to get to this spiritual fullness. But if we consider what the scriptures are saying, it's that when any teaching comes along and says you need to do X, Y, or Z in order to experience spiritual fullness, the gospel comes along to say, and you have been filled. Past tense. Once and for all, stop striving by your own works. You have been filled if you are in him. Once and for all, the Christian is complete in Christ. This is the truth that we look back on. And the next truth is that those who are in him have experienced a true and radical transformation in him. And so the first place we see this is in this, rec um, this reference to circumcision. So verse 11 says, In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of, by putting off the, body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Now let's pause there before we continue into that sentence because this could be a bit confused. And this morning, from Galatians 5, we're also referencing circumcision. But what, what's going on here is very different than what's going on in Galatians 5. You see, in Galatians 5, the, the Christians in Galatia are being told that in order to experience the salvation, they must be physically circumcised. It's another form of gospel plus. And Paul rejects that and says, no, that is not legitimate. What we have here in Colossians 2 is Paul is explaining their spiritual transformation that takes place in the life of every Christian by way of analogy, explaining it as a circumcision of the heart. So you'll recall from, from the Old Testament and the giving of the law, in Deuteronomy chapter 10, Yahweh commands his people, circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart and be no longer stubborn. And then later on in De Deuteronomy 30, he promises that he will do this. But what we see throughout the Old Testament and the Old Covenant is that the people, their hearts have not been circumcised. Their bodies maybe have, but their hearts have been unchanged. And so therefore they go on rebelling against the Lord. And so all of that background is at play when Paul tells the Colossians that they were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. That is not physical. 
described as the circumcision of Christ. So the reality here is that this thing that was longed for in the old covenant is now a reality for those who are in Christ in the new covenant. Redemptive history has fallen in such a way that we have the privilege of having our hearts circumcised in Christ, in our regeneration. And it continues, and it says, having been buried with him in baptism. So we need to pause again. Well, what's the connection here? And I think the best explanation is that when Paul is speaking of baptism, he's speaking about, he's letting baptism stand in for the entire process of conversion. And, and I think the better way to translate it, actually, this is the way the CSB does it, would be when you were buried with him in baptism. So when was your heart circumcised in him? Well, it was when you experienced salvation, which we're using baptism as a stand-in for because it's your public proclamation of that salvation. So this transformation happens when we come to faith in Christ. And what else happens when we come to faith in Christ? It is amazing. You were buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him. This is the nature of of the transformation that takes place for those who come to know the Lord Jesus truly. They go from being spiritually dead to spiritually alive by virtue of Christ's physical death and resurrection. This is amazing. But it keeps going. We're not done yet. This is done by him having forgiven us all our trespasses, by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. And this is quite the picture. Can you imagine it? Your record of debt, a a physical copy, a paper, with all of your sins listed, one after another. If your record of debt were a book, how many pages would it be? If it were a scroll, how long could you roll it out? And what does he do with this record of debt that he has against us? He nails it to the cross. He sets it aside, and this is likely a reference to when Roman criminals would be crucified, they would have their, whatever they were guilty of, nailed to the cross. And we see when Jesus is crucified, he's, he's nailed with, with this sign that says, King of the Jews, and it's a mocking accusation about him. But this is the picture we're given, that as Jesus is nailed to the cross, his only guilt is in his identifying with us. It's our record of debt that is nailed to his cross. And though his only guilt was in identifying with us, now in his victory, our only purity can be in identifying with him. This is amazing. The truth of the gospel must compel us to walk in him. But we're not done yet. Stick with me. Finally, verse 15, he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. So not only has the Lord Jesus dealt with our sin once and for all on the cross, but he's conquered and humiliated Satan in the process. And and this verse so emphatically proclaims his victory, it's hard to even express it. The the picture that's being presented here is Satan and his demons stripped naked in defeat, and paraded around the city like a Roman triumphal military procession. Utter humiliation for all time at the hand of the Lord Jesus. So is he not enough? Consider who he is. Consider what he has accomplished. And therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. This is the call we have. Conduct our lives in him. Let's pray. Father God, we, we, we don't have the mental capacity to understand these truths. But Lord, by your Holy Spirit, help us, give us grace to, 
to know them truly, Lord. For anyone who is here who has not experienced this transformation, Lord, let, let it be heavy on their heart tonight. But let us also be reminded that this is a message for believers, Lord. This is not just for evangelistic purposes, God. This is for sanctification purposes. So sanctify us by your word and by your spirit, Lord. Help us as we continue this week. In Jesus' name, amen.